So welcome to the Practice Management Study Club. Today's topic is credit and collections, how to maximize your receivable. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Joanne Friedman, NDX's Territory Sales Manager for all of Canada. Take it away, Joanne. Thanks, Jessica. It's my pleasure to introduce Sandy Balajan to you. Sandy is a leading authority on how to increase the effectiveness of dental business systems. Ms. Bailerjean is the author of three textbooks, Dental Office Administration, first and second edition, published by Top Hat Publishers and the Canadian Dental Office Administrator published by Nelson Canada. She created the first certificate course in dental practice management at the University of Toronto, Faculty of Dentistry. Sandy has lectured at dental faculties across North America and has had articles published in many journals, including the Journal of the Canadian Dental Association, Oral Health, Spectrum Teamwork, Just for Canadian Dentists, and many other publications. As owner-operator of Dental Office Consulting Services, Sandy specializes in dental practice management, consulting, hiring, coaching, and training dental teams, implementation of in-office programs, dental business, and operational plans. So Sandy, please take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, once again, I'm so grateful to be here to uh, have this opportunity to speak with you tonight and to be part of this Practice Management Study Club. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about money, uh, about financial controls and how to turn your accounts receivables into accounts received. So in this webinar, you will learn how to achieve and to uh, maintain control of your, of your collections and why that's so important. Uh, how as being an assignment versus a non-assignment office will affect your accounts receivable as well. Also, how to make effective financial arrangements for your practice that works and how to maintain control of your accounts receivable. And once again, why it's so, it's so important. So what is accounts receivable? It really doesn't make any difference how much you're, you're billing. And I, I often get, um, I will often have clients who will talk to me about how much they're billing per year, but it's more important how much you're collecting per year because everything is based on, on the collections and not only how you're collecting them, but when you're collecting them, the, the fees. The accounts receivable represents um, money owed to you for services that you've already completed. So that's an important thing to, to think about. And you deserve to obviously be compensated in a, in a timely manner as well. Sorry. Okay. So uh, I'm often asked by doctors, how much should my accounts receivable be? And they'll say to me, you know, my accounts receivable are $100,000 or, or uh, whatever. And it doesn't matter what the quantity is. The quantity is, is irrelevant. It's the quality of your accounts receivable that is important. Your accounts receivable should always be in current status. That means that 30 days or less. However, I do realize that with some uh, government programs, for example, they take longer to pay, but the majority of your accounts receivable should be in, uh, in 30, to, uh, 30 day to 60 day maximum, but even 60 days is, uh, is too long because um, uh, the, the patient will have been reimbursed by their insurance company if it's insurance driven or um, that your office would have been, would have received the funds within 60 days for sure. So it's not the quantity, it's the quality of your accounts receivable. That's, what, uh, that's why your bank will ask you for an aged accounts receivable report. Now my career before I went into uh, dentistry was uh, in banking and um, uh, I left there a long time ago, but uh, anyway, nonetheless, I worked with commercial loans. And I'm going to show you uh, some of the things that I would look at when um, uh, when we would, uh, it's called margining the accounts receivable. That, but that's why your bank manager will ask you for an aged accounts receivable, and I'll show you why. So this, this will help the bank manager um, to determine what your borrowing power is in case you need an operating line of credit, and most businesses do unless you're really well established and you've got all of your debts paid off, there are very few dental offices that don't have some form of either an operating line of credit or an operating loan. Uh, now I think it's moved mostly to uh, lines of credit. Uncontrolled accounts receivable can, re, uh, re, can dramatically affect your cash flow in a very negative way. 
So it's, it's extremely important to have proper cash flow. And why is that important? Because you need cash flow in order to pay your bills. Once again, it doesn't matter how much you're, you're billing. If you're not receiving the, the money, then you don't have the, the money to pay your bills, including things like your payroll for your staff. Uh, your dental supplies, all of the things that, that require you to pay on a regular basis. So that's, that's extremely important to remember. How you collect the money owed to you affects the value of your practice as well, because the valuation of your practice will depend a lot on the collections. And in fact, the valuations that, uh, that I've been involved with uh, do it strictly on collections. They, once again, it doesn't matter how much you're billing because it's uh, it's it's what you're collecting that is it really affects the value of your practice. It's also a, a true indicator of how your patients were trained. If they're allowed to leave your office without paying their bill, then they get used to that. And uh, and then if somebody new comes to the front desk and all of a sudden they're being asked to pay their bill, they um, get a little disconcerted. But the fact is that it's um it's how they were trained and how the staff are trained on on how to expect payment at the time of service. That's the key thing as well. We'll be talking a little bit about that as well tonight. Are patients allowed to leave your practice without paying after receiving a service? And if that's the case, that um, that's, happens a lot with assignment-based practices. If, uh, if the payments from the insurance companies are coming directly to the, to the uh, dental office, then uh, that's what, what will happen is that uh, the patients will just think that it should be covered 100%. And there are very few dental plans, by the way, that cover 100% of, um, of dentistry. However, there are, there are two in Canada that I know of. Uh, does any other business do that? Does any other, do you ever go and have a service uh, performed or done and, uh, and walk out of that establishment without paying your bill? You know, even um, if you go to a hairdresser, you obviously pay your bill before you, you leave. You're not going to say, well, you can uh, collect it from my insurance or wait till I get my hair insurance and then I might pay you. So how do they value the services that you provide if they're not paying you for the services at the time of, of service? And this just takes some training and sometimes some retraining uh, what I've found with, uh, with certain offices. Because the key is that everyone in, on your team really needs to believe in the value of the services provided and that there is a fee for them and that their job is to collect the fee at the time of service. And I'm also going to suggest if you have a large case that you um, are working on, I think that uh, I believe, and it works really, really well, is that the treatment coordinator or the receptionist should tell the patient in order to schedule that appointment for you, I will require, the doctor will require a deposit of whatever amount. So collect at least part of the fee at the time of booking, not just at the time of service. Because something you need to uh, remember is once you've put a, the drill to the tooth and you've made an irreversible change, you're stuck. You know, you have to complete that treatment. So the, uh, the fact is you can't leave a patient in limbo. And, um, uh, I've had doctors, uh, one orthodontist that stands out in my mind, and he said that the patient just simply got in his chair and said, you know, I have no, I have no intention of paying you. And she knew that, uh, that he was stuck, that, you know, he had shifted the teeth. Now he's made irreversible changes to the teeth, and, uh, and he, was, he was stuck for that money. So it's important that everyone on your team believes in the value of the care that you're providing and that there's a financial value as well. And they have to really examine their own prejudgments when they're talking to patients because those prejudgments will come across uh, very clearly. Everyone must be capable of discussing fees and payment options with patients without being insurance driven. Uh, I've found with over the years working with different staff members that it's, it's not always the patient that, uh, that is being insurance driven, that is saying, you know, if, if it's not covered by insurance, I'm not having the work done. It's often the staff members because that's what they're used to, that they came from an office that it was all insurance driven and it was all uh, assignment based. So uh, it's a matter of reprogramming and retraining the staff to, uh, to say the right things. It's very, very important to watch because these bad habits can 
develop quickly and they're silent. You won't know that these are happening uh, because you're going to see how, how hard you're working. You'll see how much you're billing uh, unless you're really keeping an eye on those collections and making sure that the staff are well trained on how to how to collect the money, then you may not notice and uh, you could be losing out on a lot of money. And change is often difficult to implement. Uh, I find that one of my biggest challenges in the offices that I go into is that exact thing, uh, is I will talk to them about uh, not being insurance driven, trying to make uh, have alternatives for payment for the patient. We're gonna talk about that tonight as well. Uh, but oftentimes it's not the patient that doesn't understand it or doesn't uh, cooperate. It's oftentimes that the, um, the staff members at the front desk are sometimes used to saying a certain thing to a patient or used to uh, just submitting to insurance and, and just uh, taking care of all that. So it's, it's really important that they are, uh, to know that they're naturally resistant, and uh, but it's it is a, just a matter of reprogramming and retraining, and uh, and your staff will uh, will comply for sure. One thing uh, that you should be aware of is uh, sorry about that Canadian uh, two dollar bill, <laughs> which doesn't exist anyway. Uh, <clears throat> but to miss their appointment, that's a known fact. So the reasons, of course, is they don't want to pay their bill because they know that they're going to be asked to pay their bill and they don't want to increase the balance that's, that they owe to you. Patients who owe you money and they've been allowed to delay the payment are also more likely to complain about their treatment. I, I've witnessed this firsthand uh, because they believe by complaining they won't have to pay. And uh, so that's an important thing to remember because you know the, uh, I've, I've had this happen firsthand where um, we'll call a patient for a collection on a collection basis and she said, oh, that tooth has always bothered me. It's never been right since I left. And you say to the patient, well, come on back and we'll fix it. And while, while you're here, you can take care of your bill and, and uh, bring it up to date. So think about this when you go to the grocery store or any, receive any type of service. Do you, uh, do you, wait to see if there's grocery insurance and, and offer to pay the, the business or, or the difference rather. Does any business do this except for, for dentistry? Dentistry is the only one that does this. So it's important to expect payment at the time of service. You wouldn't go to your car mechanic and say, you know what, I'm just gonna wait until the insurance comes in because you know you could be insured for some of that. Um, the car mechanic's not going to fix your car. So uh, keep in mind, you're also not offending patients by sending them, sending them account statements and expecting payment at the time of service. I was in one office where uh, their accounts receivable were very out of control. And I asked the uh, front desk person if she had sent out account statements. This was a number of years ago. And I realized now you can do it by email and uh, um, I'm gonna talk about the telephone again, using the telephone, that's really important. Um, but uh, anyway, she said, no, no, you can't do that because it offends our patients. So uh, I said, you know, well, let me get this straight. You know, I uh, deal with Bell Canada for my telephone service. So uh, does that mean that if, um, if, if they send me a bill, I should be offended by it? You know, I'll, I'll stop receiving the service or my, my um, heat or my electricity. You know, so it's really important that your staff really understand that. I'm a firm believer that the doctors should not discuss the fees, and I'll, I'll explain this. Uh, the reason is because the, the patients tend to think that, just like I said, you know, well, doctor, you know, that tooth has never been right since you started working on it. You know, I think um, if you took a little bit off of my bill, that it might just, you know, it might just be okay. I'll, I'll be able to live with it. It's, and, and I understand that the doctors, under, they know what the fees are. But then you turn it into being a clinical provider, into being uh, not quite a salesperson, but you are turning it into a financial transaction. Let your financial people in your office deal with the financial transactions. So the doctor should take care of the clinical treatment for the patient. So you can simply say, you know what, Diane, my treatment coordinator will be very happy to speak with you about the fees and the financial options we have available at this office as well as offer assistance with your insurance if you need it. If you have dental insurance, um, she can help you with that because you know what, Diane's an absolute expert in that area. 
So it's really important that you empower your employees to be able to have these financial uh, um, discussions, but keep the financial discussion outside of the operatory. It should be left with the business team and not with, uh, with the doctor. And um, the doctor will have a, a happier practice in, in many ways. Break free from the insurance addiction. So this is really important to examine what your own prejudgments are. And I hear this all the time in every office that I go into, the patient won't accept the treatment if it's not covered by insurance. Well, insurance companies, um, one of our future, future seminars, I think, or webinars will be on dealing with dental insurance companies uh, because part of my background is, to, is working with dental insurance. Uh, the thing is that insurance companies are financial institutions. They are out to make money. They are not out, they don't care about your patient's health. Uh, they don't care about your patient's treatment. They care about denying the claim. That's the key thing to remember with, uh, with dental insurance companies. So it's very important to make your practice patient-centered and not insurance-driven. If your practice is insurance-driven, it's at risk because when insurance companies start cutting back on the benefits that they pay out, then uh, guess who loses? It's not just the dental office, but it's <clears throat> for sure it's the patient as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, it's very important that you treat the patient and not the insurance plan. Patients will pay for what they want and what they value. And that's a matter of, uh, of discussing it with them using the proper communication skills that will help them to see the value in the treatment that they're receiving. Offer a payment plan. If uh, affordability is the reason that 50% of patients won't move forward with treatment, then offer them a payment plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. The studies have shown that your treatment acceptance can rise as much as 30% when outside financing is available or internal financing is available. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight as well. <clears throat> According to the Consumer's Preferences Index, 54% of males were never offered payment considerations, yet if they had been, 78% would have accepted treatment. The same survey, 30% of females were never offered payment options, yet 68% would have accepted treatment. So 54% of males, 30% of females divided by two. I realize that these are not exact numbers. So um, just, just for demonstration purposes only. Uh, so that's 44% of patients, uh, essentially. So th what that means is that almost half of case presentations are not accepted due to lack of, of payment options available to them. So try having an incentive to have a negative accounts receivable, you know, perhaps offer an incentive for uh, prepaying at the time of booking. Uh, you can offer a complimentary service like a tooth whitening or um, which is always a good thing to offer when you're doing any major restorative like crowns or, or uh, implants um, to whiten the, the rest of the teeth or some type of, uh, some type of complimentary, complimentary service. So the next thing is, is the accounts receivable, is it a true asset or a liability? And this is what banks look at. And that's why I'm going to be uh, going through this with you. So accounts receivable, as I mentioned earlier, represent services that you've already provided. So you've already taken care of the service. The patient has received it. They have the dentistry in the mouth. There's uh, nothing you can do to recoup that. Uh, accounts receivable is an asset to your practice and it loses its value rapidly. It's a liquid asset. Uh, I will tell you a little story. Uh, years ago, my um, uh, daughter, she's now a dental hygienist, but uh, she worked in a pet store and they were giving out loans for, um, for dogs. I approached some of the major bank banks here in Canada and uh, I asked if there was some kind of financing, you know, preferential financing that they could provide for dental patients. And they said, no, flat out, no. I said, so why can you take a loan out for a dog, but you can't take a loan out for to have your dental work done? Which in fact you can, you can take out a line of credit, a personal line of credit. But anyway, the uh, bank manager said to me, because we can repossess the dog. We can't repossess the, the dental work. So your patient has that work done, your great work done in their mouth, and there's nothing you can do if you don't accept the money at the time of service. 
So this is the true value of the accounts receivable. This is something that I did as part of my uh, job in the bank. And I'm just basing this example on a, a total accounts receivable of $100,000. Say $25,000 of it is between 30 and 45 days. So that's current, that's considered current and that's valid. 50,000 is in 60 days. So that means that your patient hasn't paid you in two months. That means that their chances are of your patient paying you are probably 75% that they won't pay you out of that 50,000. And then 25,000 is in the 90 day accounts. And the first thing that the bank manager will do or what I would do, we called it margining the accounts receivable was um, take off the 90 day accounts because they are worthless to a bank. The bank considers them to be uncollectible. And they assume if your patient hasn't paid you in three months, they have no intention of paying you ever. <clears throat> so that's, um, that's a huge loss in your practice. Depending on your business practices, there's also 75% risk that these 60 day accounts, because they already haven't paid you in two months, that they will end up in the 90 day account category. And that is worth zero to a bank manager who's trying to set you up for credit for your line of credit or uh, a business loan. Uh, so it, it's important to really watch your accounts receivable and have somebody working on it. If you find, if you run your accounts receivable uh, report tomorrow and you find that you have a large amount in 90 day, uh, 90 day accounts, then work on those first and, and get those out of the way. And, um, uh, that it's it's really important to get get at those because the longer time goes by, they think that the they don't have to pay you at all. If you have an actual loss, you will require an equal or greater amount of new sales just to offset the loss. That's just makes common sense. That means that you must have a method of attracting and retaining new patients at a rate that is at least equal to or greater than your financial loss. So an example is. Based on a total revenue of a million dollars, if you're running at a 10% loss due to uncollected accounts, that's $100,000. Uh, you must generate at least $110,000 just to offset that loss. So it, it just makes sense. This is a source from the Department of Commerce, but this is the type of graph that uh, banks will use, that credit companies will use to determine what the losses are from delinquent accounts. So if your accounts are in 60 days, that means that your business is running at a 10% loss. So uh, once again, you have, they haven't paid you in two months. If you're in 90 day accounts, 90 days, that means your business is running at a 15% loss. So you're always behind the game all the time. If you're into 120 days or one year or two years, I mean, just forget it. You might as well close your door because uh, you're running at a complete loss. Overdue accounts, this is according to the Department of Commerce, overdue accounts lose, <clears throat> lose their uh, value at a rate of 6% per month. And that means that a liberal financial policy has created a situation where your chances of collection recovery are about 30%. So you don't wanna work for nothing. I, I realize that you can have some compassion for patients that you can understand, but, and that's absolutely fine. You help them to access the healthcare they need but do so by setting up a payment plan for them that works for the, for the patient. And key thing is to follow up with that payment plan as well. So that's really, that's extremely important. Call the overdue accounts. I know that these days of text messaging and uh, emailing are much easier for your front desk staff to be working on, on text messaging and um, emailing, but the chances of your, your patient ignoring it are really high. It doesn't matter how many emails you send, they can delete, delete, delete. And uh, so it's, it doesn't really make any difference. But if you sent the, the email, the text message, and they receive a telephone call, then it's, it's very important. And I think those calls need to be made. If it's made by your financial coordinator, then he or she should say, hi, this is Sandy. I'm calling from Dr. Smith's office. Dr. Smith has asked me to call you. Please call me at, back at this number. Notice that I didn't say what it was about. I didn't say it was about an appointment, but I also name dropped the doctor a few times there just in those couple of phrases. So it's really important to say, you know, I'm just calling, not to say, I'm just calling to see when you're gonna pay your account. Say, Dr. Smith asked me to call you. 
So in other words, the patient understands that the doctor noticed this, that they haven't been paid for their services. And uh, the fact is that there's, you know, the, the dentist, um, sorry, patients don't want to come to a dentist and uh, outright, I wouldn't want to go in, in dental chair and say, you know, I have no intention of paying you <laughs> uh, because dentists have sharp instruments in their hand and uh, not that it, you would harm anybody, but um, I'm just being facetious. But the fact is that uh, it's just a stronger message. It tells the patient that, you know what, the, pay, the doctor is the one that noticed that you haven't paid your bill and the doctor is the one who asked me to call you. Patients who owe you money and have been allowed to delay the payment are more likely to complain about their treatment, as I mentioned, and they believe that they won't have to, to pay if they complain. So, of course, inform before you perform. I know that that uh, phrase has been around for a million years, uh, much like myself, but the fact is, and I know that you do this. However, I'm going to take it one step further, and I think uh, that all financial arrangements should be made before treatment has started. So I would look on the schedule. Uh, um, some of the offices that I deal with, they will put FA so the doctor knows financial arrangements have been, are in place for that treatment. And it should be done, I believe, at the time of booking. So you should have some kind of down payment or deposit. This will help your schedule, by the way, because if the patient has some type of financial vested interest in that appointment, they're going to show up for that appointment. If they make a deposit of $200 or $500, of course that's applied to the treatment, but uh, that patient will show up for the, for the appointment for sure. The only exception of course is to relieve discomfort on an emergency basis. But even with, with emergencies, you can tell the patient, the doctor will likely have to do uh, an examination and, um, and possibly one to two x-rays. So please bring uh, $150 with you or you know, whatever amount that you set. Uh, it will be a pro and we will we have to accept that at the at the time of service. So you can't I wouldn't take an emergency patient and then bill the insurance company. You can provide them with uh, with an insurance form or you can submit the claim on their behalf, but it should be payable to the to the patient. Uh, the privacy of the patient, of course, needs to be protected when you were talking about financial discussions. So if you have a private room or private area, uh, like a consult area, it's, it's ideal. Um, rather than them talking about their financial circumstances at the front desk, that's not ideal. If you can at least take them to one side and um, have a conversation uh, about the financial aspects, that's, that's really important. So recognize that it, the personal nature of the financial arrangements. <clears throat> and, uh, and then it can be also, if the patient doesn't have the money, it can be embarrassing for them. So uh, it's important to be sensitive to, to their needs, try to help them as much as you possibly can, but also have your, your firm but fair financial arrangements in place as well. Never ever prejudge a patient's willingness or ability to accept treatment recommendations and pay their bill. Because if you do that, you're making the, the, um, you're making the decision on the patient's behalf. Patients pick up on those, those signals that you're sending to them. So it's really important. You're making that decision for them on a conscious or a subconscious level. So try to examine your own prejudgments about patients, whether or not um, they will follow through with treatment. I can't tell you how many offices I've been in where I've heard doctors and staff say, if, if our patients don't have insurance benefits, then they won't have the treatment done. That's not always true. And that's clearly a prejudgment because the, uh, the fact is that patients, if they value the treatment that's being done, if they value their health, and people are much more health conscious these days, and especially senior citizens. We're gonna talk about those in, uh, senior citizens, those lovely people in, in just a couple of moments as well. Um, so don't necessarily prejudge that uh, everybody has to be covered by insurance, insurance benefits, or they won't have it done. You're putting too much, too much control into the hands of the insurance company. And then what, what would happen if those insurance benefits cease at the, uh, the insurance company uh, end or the employer end, then, then you're stuck and the patient's stuck. So it's better that the patient understands there is a fee for the treatment. If you have insurance assistance, then we'll help you get the insurance assistance that you're entitled to. And, um, and you, by the way, for any co-payments, we can set you up with the payment plan. That makes sense for you. Uh, delinquent accounts, 
there are several reasons why accounts may become delinquent. Uh, treatment of these may not have been explained before treatment was started, and I know that you inform before you perform. However, sometimes, um, I, I've certainly experienced over my 38 years that sometimes patients have selective hearing. So they're hearing what they want to hear, or they, they are trying to work out a deal before you've even uh, told them the whole thing, the whole uh, explanation. So uh, it's important to clearly explain everything. Uh, I always tell treatment coordinators when you're doing a case presentation, do the clinical first and then do insurance and, and fees at the end. Don't start with the fees because the uh, patient will, may start with, uh, well, how much is all this gonna cost? Because there is a perception that dentistry is expensive. Well, um, I take a little bit of issue with that because I think not having access to dental care is more expensive if you run into dental problems. So if you, um, if you follow up with your dental treatment and you have preventive and you pay for preventive care, you know, I think when, uh, when patients understand and know how much they're actually contributing to insurance benefits that don't really benefit them, then, um, and that if they pay for it out of pocket, there actually is a, a small tax benefit that they can claim on their, <coughs> excuse me, on their income tax. So, but lack of uh, prompt follow-up from your office when the accounts become overdue can cause a delinquent account. Uh, this indicates to the patient that it's okay not to pay the dental bill and uh, you won't bother them uh, or else payment options haven't been offered. I was in an office one time where the, um, the front desk coordinator had called the insurance company and she, knew, she knows that this patient got paid for the services and I think it was around $700 that, uh, that they received in reimbursement for the service. So the patient coordinator is calling the patient to follow up with the treatment. And she was told um, by the patient to get off her back that she had bills to pay. She had to uh, bring food in the house and pay her electric bill. So uh, when a patient receives a service and then is getting paid for that service, so that patient was paid $700 to go to the dentist that day, the dentist was paid nothing. So uh, that is outright theft. But it's important to explain everything to, to the patient to begin with, make the financial arrangements, make sure those are made before the treatment is started. And if it's a large uh, treatment, then uh, take a down payment at the time of booking. Inform the patient of the financial policy of the office, as well as any payment options that are available to them before you start the treatment. Uh, you don't want to lose a patient because of their inability to pay. So it, it's just a matter of working things out. I found with working with patients over the years that oftentimes I will uh, think that, you know, the patient doesn't have much money. They may not want to, to have large payments. And then I'll say, you know, what would fit in your budget? If we do this over three months, what would fit in your budget? And oftentimes the, the patient will come back with a higher number than I actually thought in my head. So maybe that was a little prejudgment on my part. If comprehensive treatment such as major restorative, it's recommended for the treatment, then financial arrangements, of course, need to be made. But they need to be made prior to, um, sorry, this is a little bit of a repeat, but uh, prior to the treatment, except in the case of emergencies. And discussing financial arrangements should be incorporated into each clinical case presentation. That's why we train treatment coordinators to be experts at this, experts at communication skills, at body language, um, being able to set up a, um, a payment plan for the patient. Uh, tonight, as part of your, your uh, handout, one thing I have provided you with is a credit application. So you can do some internal financing if you want to set up a payment plan with the, with the patient. Uh, so regarding uh, dental insurance, the existence of a dental plan, of course, can greatly influence the patient's ability uh, and desire to proceed with treatment. However, it's important to maintain a perspective that insurance coverage does not dictate the appropriateness of the treatment. And that's where insurance companies will play games with you, play games with the patient for sure. So when you send in a pre-estimate, for example, or predetermination, they'll send it back to the patient and it will say approved or not approved. I can't tell you how many patients have take, brought that into the dental office and said, the insurance company's not approving it. So you're, you're not giving me the right care or you're, uh, you're um, asking for something 
you are prescribing something that I don't really need. I've heard that many, many times. So that's the type of psychological games that insurance companies will play with, with patients in order to deny the claim. And remember, that's their game. That's exactly what they want to do. They want to deny the claim or postpone the claim or slow down the claim. So even if the patient is, is eligible for those services. Uh, not all procedures are covered and major restorative re uh, procedures are rarely covered. 100% um, of the current fee guide, if you're using a fee guide, depending on where you are, uh, where you're located. Um, but in, in some provinces in Canada, we use fee, fee guides and some don't. Some set their, set their own fees. But there is some uh, customized, uh, just a usual and customary fees that are, are charged for specific procedures. And that's what insurance companies use to determine what the benefits level will be at. So uh, there's always, when it's major restorative, there's always an out-of-pocket portion that the patient will have to pay, even if they have really good insurance benefits. Uh, they will have to pay an out-of-pocket um, portion. So that out-of-pocket portion, if you are an assignment-based practice, then you can break that down into a couple of payments if that will help the, help the patient um, to follow through with the treatment and, and to proceed with the treatment. If you're sending collection letters, um, not too many people send letters by snail mail any, anymore. Uh, it's usually by, by email. But nonetheless, regardless if it's email or if you happen to send one by, uh, by mail as well, it's important that the uh, letters are phrased in a firm but positive and business-like manner that makes every effort to persuade the patient to pay the debt. Now, keep in mind that patients may be embarrassed. So it's, it's important to word it in a way that will encourage the patient, you know, let's work together on this. Uh, is there something that we can do to help you? Uh, so if you use, choose your wording so it will help the patient to be encouraged to pay and um, alleviate them of the embarrassment of not having paid, then that will, um, that will help your accounts receivable as well. Using credit and recovery services or collection agencies, unpaid accounts need to be referred to them while there's still any hope of settlement. Uh, if, if it's gone into the 120-day account, then chances of that patient paying are, are pretty slim. Usually no more than three months at the end, at the end of treatment. <clears throat> but hopefully your staff will have followed up with that uh, beforehand, so that won't happen. Uh, the agency needs to be given all of the information that will be helpful and should be kept informed of any new information that you have. Uh, the agency should be notified promptly if the patient pays directly to the dental office <clears throat> because the collection services will be relentless in following up with the patient. Um, be very careful. It depends on the area that you're in when you're using uh, credit recovery services, whether you're in Canada or the US or uh, any other countries. But some of the, uh, some of the laws will prohibit you from affecting a patient's credit rating. And the reason is for, uh, because the credit rating will be affected for a period of seven years if they've gone to collections. Here in Canada, it's called Equifax, which is the credit bureau. So if the collection service reports to the credit bureau, then that uh, stain will stay on the patient's record for a period of seven years. But the other thing that stays on that patient's record is your name. The dentist's name. Now, our regulatory colleges here uh, will consider that to be a breach of patient and doctor confidentiality. I know that sounds a little silly uh, because of the fact that if you send the patient a letter, your name is on it, and the patient's name is on it. So, you know, that's that. But uh, that's how the regulatory colleges will uh, look at that. So, and some of the laws in the different states that you're in or provinces that you're in uh, may be the same. So my advice to you would be when you're using a credit and collection service is just tell them, you know, do all the means that you normally do to try to collect this money. And uh, then if it gets to the point that you've tried everything and you, the next step would be to report to the credit bureau or the credit agency in your area, then, um, then please refer the account back to us. And uh, that being the case, chances are once the collection services start their, their uh, diligence, 
then the uh, patient will, will generally pay. You, you'll have to pay a recovery fee, of course, to the collection service, but the fact is that the, at least you got something. <clears throat> if that account has been referred back to you before it goes to the credit bureau, then just write it off as a bad debt. But then at the same time, don't be doing new work for that patient. <clears throat> so I wouldn't schedule appointments for that patient to come in and have any major, a major work done. Uh, flag them on your computer system and um, and you may uh, it depends on where, where they are with treatment you can't always dismiss the patient because they owe you money if you're in the middle of treatment you have to complete the treatment that's why it's so important to have your financial arrangements made uh, at the time of booking the appointment in the first place uh, from time to time you may uh, wish to provide an incentive like a, a discount which uh, we call professional courtesies. And there are three reasons that I consider that you, you should maybe um, not do discounts. Number one, you're not doing discount dentistry. You're not performing discount dentistry. Patients often think, number two, often think that you can discount your fees that you were overcharging all along. So it's no big deal because everybody thinks that dentists are rich anyway. Uh, number three, according to ethical practice standards, if you order a discounted fee, whether or not you advertise it, you must charge the same fee to every patient. Now, I ran into some difficulties in certain, uh, certain areas when I would give this uh, information in the lecture. And they say, but we give seniors discounts. Uh, we do, and you know, you've got to feel sorry for the seniors because, you know, they have limited funds. They ha they're on a pension. Well, in, in Canada, at least, I can't speak for other countries uh, because I don't know the statistics, but I do know in Canada that seniors hold 77% of wealth in the Canadian economy. So the, uh, the fact is that seniors um, have, they have money, they have the time, they are excellent patients to have in your practice, and they value healthcare, they value prevention. So they're, they're the perfect um, patients to have in your practice and not to just assume because they're a senior citizen that that they don't have any money uh, and that they need a discount. The other thing you need to consider is if you're offering a senior citizen a discount and you know they're booking their uh, their next uh, cruise, <laughs> uh, seniors cruise or whatever, then um, it's very important to uh, think about who's listening to that. You know it could be a single mom with two or three kids that could really appreciate a, a discount on her, the services because she, she wants to get her kids' um, uh, health taken care of. So uh, if you offer a discount to one person, you need to really offer it to everyone. And the fee is the fee is the fee. It should be the same across the board. If the patient can't afford it, then work out a payment plan for them, but don't discount your fees because uh, uh, number two, I think is the most important thing that they think you're overcharging all along if you can suddenly discount it. From a practical perspective, the average dental practice offers, uh, uh, sorry, operates at 65% overhead expenses. So 60 to 65%. If you've collected 90% of what you've billed at the time of service, that means that you've actually earned 25% of, of what you've billed. You know, that's going to seem a little ridiculous until I explain uh, how I came up with that number. 100% is what you build. And by the way, that's what you're taxed on, is your billings, uh, not necessarily your collections, minus your overhead expenses. So that's 60 to 65%. I'm just using 65%. Um, so that's your light, your heat, keeping uh, everything running, your payroll, the, your dental supplies, etc. So that means that you're actually... Um, earning 35% of what you've billed. If you discount that, if your collections are at 90%, that means that you've got e even 10% accounts receivable, which is if it's over 90 days, that means, or you've discounted by, by 10% your services, that means you're actually collecting or you're earning 25% of what you have billed. If you discount your fees even by 10%, I'm sorry, that I meant to say the accounts receivable. If the accounts receivable are at 90%, that means that you are now earning 25% uh, of what you've billed. If you discount your fees by 10%, then you will be reducing your earnings by to 15%. So that your 25% uh, 
remember that you've got 90% of accounts receivable. Um, sorry, 90% collections, that's 10% uh, outstanding in your accounts receivable. Then, uh, and then you discount that 10%. Uh, so the golden age is uh, really is the aging baby boomers. They're your best, your best patients. In the next 10 to 20 years, the aging baby boomers are going to be inheriting money from the previous generation. And they have increased disposable income. Also, they represent the largest part of the market share. And they also uh, value health. They value prevention. They're living longer. A lot of them who, who may live alone, they're, they love to come to the dental office because it's a day out and it's a, it's a social contact for them. So these are great patients to have and they value aesthetics and, and health. Don't uh, think because, because somebody is 75 that they might not be interested in implants. In fact, implant supported dentures are huge with, um, with the 75 year olds or, or any of the senior citizens because they're tired of, of uh, dentures that don't fit properly or even just having, um, just having uh, implants. So the baby boomers have turned into Zoomers. I'm sure you've heard that term before. That's the 50 plus category. It's the single most influential group in the world. They have led and transformed every market and they hold a large percentage of wealth in the economy. So dentistry, is uh, a relationship business and it's important that you maintain that relationship within your office and that's why you can do internal financing yourself and uh, that's why i provided you with a credit application if you wish to extend credit to a patient it's very easy to establish a policy of creating payment plans and i will tell you if you are concerned about checking a patient's credit rating if a patient has been coming to you for a number of years and they've always paid their bills on time and they've never uh, run into any type of delinquency, then celebrate that with the patient and say, do you know what, Mrs. Smith, you have been here for 10 years. You've always paid your bills on time. I'm happy to do this for you because you've established a great credit rating with our office. You know, you've uh, just been a great patient and uh, you've always paid on time. So we're going to break that into a payment plan that you can afford, you know, afford uh, affordable chunks. So this makes dentistry more affordable for your patients by breaking the, it into monthly payments and installments that they can, they can afford. Third party financing, I know this is probably a question that will come up tonight. Um, should you use it or not? Uh, it's entirely up to you. I'm not going to uh, judge one way or the other. One thing I will ask you to do is to read the fine print, really look into this and delve into it. So the pros to third party financing are uh, low interest rates for patients, but some of the some of the companies there are some uh, some credit companies that will charge the interest to the dentist. So uh, I found that out through some of the companies um, here. They're, they have multiple layers lenders rather, so it helps mac maximize the approval rates. Uh, it there's minimal staff involvement, so the staff just. Um, you know, helps the, to fill out the a credit application and that's it. It eliminates collection risk because the third party financer will take care of that because they're a bank, basically. The entire fee is paid at the beginning of the treatment. So it looks like a win-win for the dentist and it's fast approval process and treatment can start now. The cons against this, is the administration fee to the doctor uh, now, the administration fee, and as I mentioned, it, some of the third-party finance companies will actually charge the interest that they are not charging the patient, they'll charge it to the doctor. So say, for example, your fee would be discounted by 17% uh, because of the fact that you're paying for the, for the interest. So you're essentially discounting your fees. And with the example that I just showed you, why would you do that? It's, it's, um, you're not getting full value out of your practice. It transfers the relationship, and that's really the most important thing out of this entire thing. It's your choice whether to use a third-party financer, but it transfers the relationship between the doctor and uh, the patient to now the doctor, the patient, and a third party. And by the way, that third party is a bank, so they don't necessarily care about, um, about your patient's health. They care about getting paid back because they're providing a loan. The cost of the practice can be higher 
and it's very high retroactive interest rates. Now, some of the companies, that, um, depends on the companies, they all work differently, but they will charge, they'll say it's interest free, you know, for a year, but then at the end of that year, if you haven't paid anything, then it's a retroactive interest rate and oftentimes it's 28.8%. The patient cannot always afford the payments through third party financing. And at this point you might be saying, well, you know what, I'm a dentist, I'm not a bank. Dentistry is a relationship business. So remember that you've worked hard on establishing that relationship with your patient. It's a relationship built on trust. And trust is very fragile. Once it's broken, then it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to get back. So third party financing transfers the relationship and the trust. <clears throat> it's like bringing a third party into a marriage, uh, unless it's a dog or a cat, it doesn't usually, uh, usually work. Uh, the other thing, so, so as I say, just read between the lines, just make sure that you understand all the ins and outs about third party financing and then make it, make it an informed choice on your own. Uh, but I looked into one and, and I found out that the fee was to the user, the dentist. There was an annual startup fee, <coughs> excuse me. There was, uh, uh, this one killed me, the monthly non-users fee. So if the doctor didn't use the, uh, uh, use the service, then they would be charged a non-user's fee. So the monthly user's fee, if the patient doesn't meet specific criteria, uh, they're charged 28.8% interest. And once again, as I said, it's retro retroactive. 10% administration fee every time a loan is advanced and interest is charged to the doctor, but not to the patient, only if he or she qualifies. So it's really a risky business uh, the other thing is they can and will report to the credit bureau because they are a bank. The black mark will stay off on the, uh, stay on the patient's credit rating for seven years. And that is considered in some areas a uh, breach of confidentiality, which violates federal privacy laws. Your name will stay on that report for a period of seven years. So it's, uh, it's a big problem with, um, with using that. Uh, dentistry is a relationship biz business built on trust, of course. Don't spoil your relationship by getting your patient involved in something that they may not want in the long run. It may seem good in the beginning, but in the end, they will blame you and resent you for it. Uh, I dealt with a client who actually had a patient who became violent in the office because he used a third-party financing, and that finance company was relentless in uh, following up with the patient, and, um, and the patient consequently got, uh, became violent with the doctor. It's terrible. You never want to see something like that happen. So um, how does this getting your patient involved it help to foster a trusting relationship? It's better if you can do your own internal financing. As I say, if your patient has established a credit rating with you, they've always paid their bills on time, then, uh, then you can provide them with a, a short term, the shorter the better, a short term uh, payment plan. And um, as I say, as part of your handout tonight, you have received a credit application. That credit application has been vetted through, uh, and a policy, I think I attached a policy to that, um, has been vetted through a credit collection service, a bank, uh, and a bank manager uh, as well. So in-house in financing makes it easy for your patients to pay. And that's really what you want to do. This is real interest-free financing. I did this years ago with the large institution that I was working with. And we introduced interest free financing and for dental, dental plans. And um, the patients looked at me like I had two heads. You know, there's nothing interest free. What's the catch? You know, they were always uh, concerned that there was more to this, but it really truly was interest free financing. I said, we're not in, in the interest, sorry, in the business of the, being a bank. We just want you to pay for your dental services. Uh, you know, and uh, so once you paid for those, it truly is interest free. You need to have a written and signed payment agreement for extensive payment plans. And that's what I provided you with the handout. Offer equal, equal monthly uh, payments. Tell them that there is no interest and no service charge. That's, uh, that's even more helpful. Uh, the payment plan should never be extended beyond a year. This is ideal for ortho or uh, yeah, ortho um, payment plans. And that's how it originally started with me. But then I realized that uh, other patients wanted, wanted the payment plans as well. And, uh, but the shorter term, the better. If you can do it over three months payments, then that's, that's even better. And remember, 
when you're setting this up, if they can leave a down payment right off the bat, then that's uh, helpful not only for your schedule, but for your accounts receivable as well. Use a proper credit application. And even if you know the patient, take down their identification, put it right on the, on the form. It's amazing too, when a patient signs their signature, uh, that that makes a big difference. They understand that they're responsible for the payment. You can have the payment pay through um, credit cards. You can also have them pay through automatic debit through the banks, like, um, you know, an automatic debit is. So, uh, and that's easy. You just check it, check it once a month. And um, one thing I would suggest to you is that if you are using automatic debit, uh, debits, do it at the same time uh, each month. All of your debits would go through on one day for like the 15th, for example. The reason I'm telling you that is because when I first started doing that, I would ask the patient when is the best time of month and they would give me all different dates, which meant I had to check the banking every single day to make sure those debits went through. So it's, it's easier if, um, uh, if you just pick one day like the 15th, which may be a quieter day, not month end, and, uh, and process all the payments. So the advantages of this is it increases the patient's ability to accept treatment. It's an excellent marketing tool, by the way. Uh, it increases the cash flow to the practice and it reduces your accounts receivable. You can even have a little sign like this, you know, don't know uh, dental insurance, ask us about our interest-free dental financing program. And, uh, and you can set it up like that. So credit applications need to be completed and stored in the business office under lock and key because that is confidential information. Uh, market this to your patients as an interest-free and service charge-free loan. Establish payment methods either by pre-authorized credit card payments or pre-authorized debits. Uh, and the patient must, if it's pre-authorized debits, they need to leave a void check because you need the numbers on the bottom of the check for the automatic debits. Now there is a risk, there's always a risk that the patient won't have enough money in the account or on their uh, credit card. However, if you are checking it, let's say on the 15th, you're putting through all your automatic debits. On the 16th, you go into the account and see if anything has been returned to NSF and you contact the patient immediately. In the old method of doing this, if somebody wrote a check, that would have to be cleared at the bank and then you would wait a week or two uh, and then you'd have to contact the patient. Now the patient's just um, headed off to their vacation in Cuba. And um, so, you know, it's, uh, it takes a long time and then it's less likely that you're going to collect the money. But if the day that that money's due, if the following day it hasn't gone through, you contact them immediately and uh, there's less chance of them defaulting on the loan. Then call it a loan. Speak to your uh, bank manager or customer care representatives. Most bank banks have the capacity to um, put a software in your practice. Uh, and I've worked with many practices that have done this. So the automatic debits are really, really easy. Uh, the patient will provide you with a void check. So you have all that information on the bottom of the check and the money will automatically be withdrawn from their account and put into your account on the same day. It's kind of like direct deposit, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with with insurance companies. So the total administration time is five minutes and it takes about one hour maybe to enter the payments. Um, so, which is always a, a really good activity. So in summary, <clears throat> tonight's webinar, you have learned how to control and maintain your accounts receivable. It's the quality of your accounts, not the quantity of your accounts that's most important. Make financial arrangements before your treatment has started for a greater success rate and provide a variety of different options to help your patients access the dental care that they need. Thank you so much for your time and attention as always.